This afternoon, the MP for Medina, Francis Xavier Tosu, is, has been hauled before court and would have to answer criminal charges. Police confirmed this afternoon they have filed and obtained criminal sermons, which they say have been duly served on the MP, asking him to appear before court on Monday. Director of Police Public Affairs, ACP Kwesi Furi, uh, has been giving details to my colleague Joseph Akable on the sidelines of the IGP's meeting with civil society groups. Joseph will join Join me shortly with details of that meeting. But first, listen to that interview with ACP Kwesi Furi. The police administration decided this morning to meet leaders and captains of civil society to enable us brainstorm. The police administration is very much aware the powerful nature of civil society organizations. Though they are non-profits in nature, they are very powerful in shaping our social systems and general society. And have power even to shape political, economic, and other structures in society. Therefore, in humble terms, the IGPM members of his administration are here to listen to you, to hear you, to tell them a story that may help in reshaping our DA Ghana Police Service. Concept that may help to move the Ghana Police Service ahead and to be able to deal with community issues, society issues regarding crime fighting and providing the best of services in terms of safety and general security for our country. We'll be getting more reactions from the police headquarters because the police has also been meeting uh, CSOs and they've also been raising some concerns. But in Parliament, Speaker Alban Bagbin has been fuming with rage over attempts by the police uh, to flout his earlier directive and arrest MP for Medina Francis Soso even before the Privileges Committee began its probe into the contempt case against two senior police officers. In the view of the Speaker, the action of the police is not only a violation of the constitution but also disingenuous the speaker in a statement issued earlier today observed that the attempt to arrest mr susu during a church service last sunday is an affront to parliament and its powers now we'll be, we can listen to um some mps who've been reacting to the charges with more from Parliament. Uh, Parker, the Speaker also raised concerns over the interdiction of police officers assigned to the Medina MP. But first, how um, has he been reacting to this fresh uh, charges pressed on the um, MP? Hello, Parker. I'm saying that what were the earlier concerns of the Speaker and how is he reacting to this fresh charges on the MP? The police administration decided this morning to meet leaders and captains of civil society to enable us brainstorm. The police administration is very much aware the powerful nature of civil society organizations. Though they are non-profits in nature, they are very powerful in shaping our social systems and general society and have power even to shape political, economic, and other structures in society. Therefore, in humble terms, the IGPM members of his administration are here to listen to you, to hear you, 
to tell them a story that may help in reshaping our dear Ghana police service concept that may help to move the Ghana police service ahead and to be able to deal with community issues, society issues regarding crime fighting and providing the best of services in terms of safety and general security for our country. We can now go back to Parliament and get some reactions from members of Parliament. That video for you. Thankfully, Parker has joined us again. Parker, tell me what were the concerns of the speaker Bagbin earlier and how is he reacting to these fresh charges coming from the police? Well, so, Asha, the statement from the speaker clearly indicates that the Speaker of Parliament, Aban Babin, is incensed over the attempt by the police to arrest the member of parliament for Madinda constituency. And this arrest we are talking about is the one that was almost effected last Sunday. Now, the speaker says he had already uh, asked the Privileges Committee to look into the matter. So clearly, the attempt by the police to arrest the MP is an affront to parliament. It's actually uh, disrespecting his powers and quite disingenuous. And he recounted how uh, he has his office has in the past helped or assisted the police in investigating members of parliament. So uh, he's quite surprised and taken aback by the latest development. In fact, he also touched on the interdiction of the bodyguard assigned to the member of parliament and says that this will clearly um, bring down morale amongst the police officers who, are, uh, uh, who have been detailed to protect members of parliament. And now as we speak, the member of parliament, Francis Xavier Sosu, is naked and that is not good at all. And he insisted that in the statement again, that the processes must be followed in order to ensure that the MP is arrested or is brought before the police for, for, for interrogation. But this latest twist about the charges against him which is causing damage to public property. Some members of the House have been expressing their opinion on the matter. Well, some of them are not too happy about the charges because they believe it's, it's far-fetched. Uh, I spoke to the Member of Parliament for Empire's Constituency, uh, that is David Zopoku, and, and his point was that, how do you establish that the Marina MP incited the youth or the individuals uh, to bend the ties on the road. That is a very difficult thing to do. And he believes that the people who were involved in the act should be the ones to be arrested and not to the member of parliament. So this criminal summons against the NP is far-fetched. There are those who have also said that, well, the police is trying to rock shoulders with parliament and they want to compete with parliament over superiority which is a matter of a challenge to them. And that if that is where they want to go, Parliament can even, in a way, boycott their budget when it's submitted before the House. So the member of Parliament for Huawei, that is Peter Tiobu, he actually made this point to me and indicated that even though he's been charged by the police officially, the processes again would have to be, be followed where the MP would, would, would require or the court, the court would have to serve the MP for the MP to appear before it. And the speaker has mentioned that even though this meeting is a very busy meeting for members of parliament because currently they are preparing themselves to interrogate the budget that will be presented to the House. That is the 2022 budget that will be presented to the House. Again, there's an issue of the anti-gay bill which is currently before the House. So this meeting, obviously, is going to be a very uh, challenging one for the members of parliament. So he doesn't want any individual to obstruct a member of parliament from 
executing his constitutional mandate. And so uh, if the serve him, well, the speaker will have to look at the nuances and the, and the, the dynamism and all do all the analysis before uh, he makes the member of parliament available for the court process. So for them, uh, they are ever ready, they're happy with the move now that the, the police has decided to serve him, that's fine. But they are hoping that the court will also go through the process, the right process, to ensure that the member of parliament submits himself to the rule of law. For me, and let's listen to Peter Tobo, who's been speaking on this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, the police has a responsibility to prevent crime, maintain law and order, and of course, prosecute people who have offended the law. So it's, it's, it's a constitutional mandate. The member of parliament, Omadina, has some constitutional privileges. He has some immunities. And there is a procedure to arrest an MP. There is a procedure to serve court proceedings on an MP. And the police knows that. So after charging him, if they think that he's contributed to causing damage to public property, or he's caused damage to public property, it is their right to charge him. And you know, they have the duty to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the member of parliament is guilty of the charge. But that notwithstanding, they will still have to serve him with the court processes. The fact that you fly it in the media, that the honorable member has been charged with a particular offense by the police, doesn't mean that you find the honorable member in court. It doesn't work that way. They will have to still go through the procedure and serve it on the honorable member through the legal aid or the laid down procedure through the, through the, through the speaker. He, he said to appear before court on November 8th. Uh, that is just about five days away from today. And looking at the engagement between him, parliament and the police, is the house ready to release him for uh, such processes to go through? I think that this whole show is, is, is just some exercise in futility. The police and parliament must begin to learn how to work together for national development. It is not a competition. I said this yesterday. The police and parliament cannot compete over who is superior. The police and, and parliament must complement each other's effort to build the country Ghana. If you think that you can charge him and fly it on, on social media or publish it for people to see that the MP has been charged and for that matter he should appear before court, the MP is not going to appear before court until he's released, released by the Speaker of Parliament. And the Speaker is saying, as we speak, we are very tight in Parliament and he cannot release the MP. And if you want to even take a statement from him, as established by the former Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Mike Okwe, Right? Professor Mike Okwe says, you can come here, I will allow the, the MP to meet you in my chamber. And you can sit down there and take all the statements that you want to take to us, to let the MP assist you in investigations. So if they have been able to get a statement from him, that is fine enough. If they have not been able to get a statement from him and they think that they can charge him straight away with the piece of evidence they have gotten and place him before court, it is also the right of the police to do that. But all in all, the member of parliament will still have to be served through the lay down process. Uh, Parker, what else has been happening in Parliament? All right, so before we get Paka in, uh, Aka Blay, who's been monitoring this meeting with the police, has also joined us with more. Uh, Aka Blay, what explanation has the police been giving you for pressing these charges on the Medina MP? Hello, Aka Blay. Hello, Aisha. Go ahead. It was quite a brief, I mean, explanation that the CPC for offered us. And the point he made is that, I mean, they have already indicated uh, through various statements as to the nature of the investigations that they are undertaking relative to the MP. Uh, but the point he's making is that the latest is that uh, they have pressed the charges against him. And they filed the charges, then he's supposed to appear in court on November 8th. So that is by way of and what they've been able to do so far. The other issue that we sought clarification from him on had to do with issues related to uh, two of the ex-men, the policemen who have been asked to appear before Parliament to the use committee. And he says that particular invitation is yet to reach Parliament. And once yes, reach the Ghana Police Service, I must say, and once it reaches the Ghana Police Service, it will take a decision as to the next line of action. So, Parker, we know that the police has also been meeting the CSOs. What have been the issues uh, that they are raising at the meeting? And what has been the police's response? Hello, Pac, um, um, Akable? These issues first 
concerns about general policing. They also raised issues uh, relative to the involvement of the military to handle protests as well as at the space of armed robbery among others. And so those were the matters that they put before the police. And the police said that uh, they have obtained some suggestions from some of the security analysts that participated in this particular meeting as to how to address those concerns. And in terms of the specific roadmap, it's not something that I'm going to put out by way of the strategies, except that it's going to be a collaborative effort. The aim or the end goal is to ensure that the country is safe and peaceful for every Ghanaian. And so they intend to have such regular engagement with the civil society organizations as and when in order to decide to strategize on how to deal with those matters. The civil society organization had the opportunity uh, to an interview the grants that us. A senior vice president of Imani Africa uh, uh, to spoke on their behalf, and they touched on the issues related to uh, Mr. Sosu, who uh, we know now that the place of power charges against him. And he said, as far as he's concerned, uh, no one has immunity in the country except the president. And so whoever the police has probable cause to investigate or want to arrest, that person must submit to the authority of the police to enable the police investigation. But if that does not happen, then it's important that we are working against the law enforcement agency that we all want to be a professional one. Joseph Akable uh, with those updates. Uh, Paka is still in Parliament for us. Paka, what else uh, can you report from Parliament? Well, so, Asha, a few statements uh, were made today uh, to the effect that the prices of cement have gone up, and so the uh, government would have to do something about that. Uh, the statement was made from the minority side, but then the majority uh, in parliament uh, disagreed with the situation. Uh, they were expecting the minority to provide a sequence of the price hikes over the years gone by and make a very meaningful in their own word, meaningful comprise but that wasn't done and they believe that uh smacks of malice and deceit on the part of the minority well just a while ago we understand there's a report from uh, the piac the 2020 report from piac uh which has been submitted before the house by the finance committee and that is what currently before the house for uh, for debate so uh certainly the house after the debate, we'll pass a resolution on the issue. Parker, uh, join us from Parliament. I will bring following events there and bring you updates in our subsequent uh, bulletins. The Greater Accra Regional Health Directorate has announced plans to administer Moderna vaccines across all the 29 districts in the Greater Accra Region. Addressing the press on Wednesday, the Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Charity Sapon, disclosed that the exercise is targeted at persons who have not taken any job since vaccination began across the country. In all, over 216,000 individuals are expected to be vaccinated from Friday, November 5. Pregnant women and persons below 18 years will, however, be exempted from the five-day exercise. The good news for us this time is that starting from Friday, coming Friday, 5th November 2021, through to 10th November 2021, uh, we are beginning the vaccinating people who have not been vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine. For us in Greater Accra Region, because this is Greater Accra Region, this is the first time that we are giving out the Moderna vaccine. Since we started in March, like I said, we have given out the AstraZeneca vaccine, we have given out the Sputnik vaccine, and we have also given out the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And now we are also giving out, rolling out the Moderna vaccine. All the vaccines have been proven to be very effective and efficient in preventing um, COVID-19 illness and even if you get it once you are vaccinated it's improving that the illness is not as you know serious as those who have not been vaccinated so the purpose is to ensure that as many as possible of the entire population is protected against the COVID-19. And for this particular exercise, we are expecting to reach out to a little over 216,000 persons.
The Regional Director of Health Services further disclosed that in addition to the station vaccination centers, mobile teams will also be deployed to move within the various districts to administer the Bondena vaccines accordingly. And then we'll also be having static uh, mobile teams. Every district will also be carrying out mobile teams. And then we also want to appeal to the general public, organized groups like churches or even organization if you all student association if you think your people are not vaccinated within the district where you are located just liaise with the district health management team there and you know once you liaise with them they will organize with you and ensure that all your people are vaccinated either they will come around or set a place aside for you so all organized groups please take advantage and where you don't know where your district is you can contact any of my deputy directors public health um, dr akosu sike you see she is the lead for the vaccination this time you can contact her and she will immediately liaise you to your district no, Dr. Sapo has the bank claims that some vaccines are more effective than others. Reacting to the issue, she emphasized that all the vaccines that have been rolled out since the onslaught of the pandemic have been tried and tested with equal efficacy. She therefore urged the general public to discard their fears and participate massively in the exercise which starts on November 5 to November 10. She also assured that measures have been put in place to cater for persons who may experience any side effects from the vaccination. Some of the districts that report about, you know, sometimes people having a preference for a particular vaccine. But then we want to give the assurance that every vaccine that has been rolled out, deployed for COVID-19, has been, you know, well researched into and have been proved to be very efficient and effective in combating or protecting us against COVID-19. So I want to appeal to everybody. I mean, as and when we get the vaccines and they are rolled out, they are all equally effective. There is not one that has a better advantage over the other. No, they are all equally effective. So as and when any of the vessels become available, let us avail ourselves and make sure we take the job. If you say you are waiting for a particular one and it's not in, you don't know what is going to happen in the next second, the next meet or the next day. You may be exposed to COVID-19 and depending on your situation and underlying condition, you may not either survive it or you may have the very severe form. So please, we are telling you that every vaccine that is deployed has been researched both internationally and also by our regulatory bodies in Ghana. And they have all been proved to be effective, to be safe and efficient in combating COVID-19. Beginning next year, all newborns will be given a national ID number. That's according to the Vice President, Dr. Mama Dubaumia. He says the move forms part of government's vision to digitize the economy following the digitization of the Bets and Deaths Registry. Listen to him as he spoke at uh, Ashasi University Tuesday. Starting next year, ladies and gentlemen, every newborn child well, within, because we are linking the beds and deaths with the NIA and the Ghana Health Service, every newborn child will, within a month, be issued with a national ID number. And so when you are issued at birth, you will have your national ID number, and that will be your number until death. But you can only be issued a, biometric, a card when your biometrics are fully formed. That is after you are six years old and, and going. Then you will get a card. But for now, you will have a paper card to give you your national ID number, which you will use all the way um, in life.
We can now uh, cross over to uh, the UPSA Law School and pick the live event uh, on the quarterly roundtable discussion where experts are discussing the topic banks, trade, financing and the uh, AFCFTA. Let's take you live there. More effectively drive the after preparatory process since 2015. He was a lead technical advisor to the Department of Trade and Industry of African Union Commission on the AFTA. That's our first guest, Mr. Prudence Sebahizi. If he's here, let's see him. Please take your place. Yes, take your place. I mean, in due time, I also introduce those who have welcomed you to our campus. Now, our second guest is Mr. Kobuna Solomon. Mr. Kobuna Solomon is an economist and holds an MSc in economics and consumer psychology from the University of Exeter in the UK and a BA in economics from the University of Ghana. He has several certifications in trade and transactional banking, as well as a year's leadership certificate from the Duke University. Kobuna has over 13 years banking experience and is the regional head for the East and West Africa trade sales and overseas, a team that has over a billion US dollars in short-term assets and contingent liabilities. He is an expert in solutioning. He's an expert in solutioning clients with various documentary credits, bonds, and indemnities, short-term loans, and overdrafts, structured trade and commodity finance structures. He also has extensive coverage experience solutioning multinational clients, local large corporates, parastatals, business, banking, and SME clients in the major sectors of the economy, such as oil and gas, power, agric, mining, and manufacturing. He is passionate about people and the African continent and the potential he holds. These are our guests for today. <laughs> Mr. Kobla Solomon, please take your seat. Thank you. I'll be very happy if you took a small time when you have the microphone to tell us what this solutioning of clients exactly is. Very well, yes. So now, before we begin and set the ball rolling, we have some opening remarks from the dean of the UPSA Law School. See, when you come to somebody's home, you must be welcomed properly. And so I'd like to invite Dean, Professor Kofi Abochi, to do the welcome remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, MC Koshiga. Our invited guests, representative from APSA, my own good friend, Isilfo, other distinguished personalities here present, Ladies and gentlemen, we're delighted today to have the opportunity of welcoming you to our campus for our guests and for our students to give you the opportunity of being the first witnesses to the physical meeting of the APSA UPSA, APSA UPSA Law School Banking Quarterly Roundtable. This platform has become perhaps the most important platform, sustained and regular platform for conversation on all issues affecting banking in Ghana. We're mindful that we are a law school and our immediate preserve is the law. However, there's nothing about banking that doesn't have legal implications. The very essence of the banking relationship is one that implicates contract. And throughout that spectrum of engagement, the banking relationship is fundamentally legal. Therefore, this conversation is not one outside the remit of the law school. It is one in respect of which we believe and do have the deep convi conviction is within our boundaries. It is a platform, particularly as the MC mentioned, uh, which was inspired mainly by the difficulties of the banking crisis 
that resulted in all kinds of regulatory reforms and substantive reforms, some of which are still ongoing. We thought it is imperative to have a platform where we feed into policy through a sustained conversation. And as the MC did mention, we have had the privilege of having delved into some of the most important topics, including the issue of corporate governance and the issues of uh, toxic assets, among others. Today's conversation provides us another opportunity to, de to delve into a very important subject that affects not just banking per se, but perhaps the most important transcontinental conversation, trade. The AFCFTA has brought African trade into being and the regime is here to stay. To what extent are their work implicated by banks and the issue of trade financing? How can banks leverage on the AFCFTA, first of all, to maximize their own profits and profitability, but also to ensure that they facilitate the conduct of trade, which fundamentally has to do with money or the issue of financing. It is my expectation that with the two most important personalities who have been assembled on stage today to speak on the subject, the most eminently qualified, your new name being Solutioning, the most eminently qualified APSA personality, whose portfolio clearly indicates that he indeed is highly qualified to speak to the subject, and the AFCFTA person who has just been pulled off a plane, as I understand, having landed from Libreville, but has still found today's meeting sufficiently important enough to run straight from the airport onto the stage to conduct an assignment which clearly comes under his remit. We are very grateful for our relationship with APSA and indeed for APSA agreeing to have become, so to speak, the headline sponsor of this platform and has, as it were, brought his name into our name, for which it's called the UPSA, the APSA UPSA Quarterly Banking Roundtable. And we are very delighted for the relationship we've built over the period with the AFCFTA. Indeed, the Secretary General himself was a member of a panel, not a panel, he spoke on the platform of the Africa Trade Roundtable, which is again one of our important uh, conversation platform. The Secretary General himself was here, and we've had the opportunity of inviting him to the UP UPSA campus on other engagements. Today, once again, we do have um, a very important personality from the AFCFTA to speak on the subject. We're building a relationship and we're delighted at the path that we keep chatting together. We look forward to more to come. Thank you all for gracing the occasion and I do hope that we'll have a very lively conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our guests, most eminently qualified and our friend who just landed from the plane, we'd like to welcome you to the UPSA campus. Now, we, I want to introduce the moderator for this, for this, for this event. The moderator for this event is Mrs. Christine Opoku Nina. Well, I, I needed to be very careful there because the names have changed. So, so I got a little confused actually. So you have Mrs. Opoku Nina is a lecturer at the UPSA Law School. She's a qualified barrister in England and Wales and a qualified attorney at law in the state of New York. She holds a Master of Laws degree in international law and international relations, and she's a first class LLB degree from the University of Kent in United Kingdom. She pursued her bar professional training education in Nottingham Trent University in the UK. I believe you may have heard of her recently when she was called to the bar. She was all over the news. She's the moderator for today's event. So, Christine, if you are here, let's have you. Please, let's put our hands together for her. I now like to invite a remark from Nana Isilfu Atamaklo, Marketing and Corporate Relations Director, Absa Bank before we go into other parts of the event. Please put your hands together for her. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, let me observe the protocols. Uh, do we have the dean, the vice chancellor? I was told she was going to be here. OK. Thank you. But I have representative from the Bank of Ghana, 
and um, there are other faculty members and heads of um, departments here of the UPSA. And then I also do believe my former colleague um, from the Chartered Institute of Bankers is here. So, and then the panelists and media partners uh, who are here, ladies and gentlemen, and I can see some students here as well. So good afternoon again, and it's indeed um, very great partnering with um, UPSA. Uh, this is the second year for us. You can say for the first year, we took a leap of faith. And um, the fact that we are here for the second year shows the value that we have gained out of this partnership. And that's why we are here again for the second year running. And um, I'm also very pleased that for the, for the time that we've sponsored, this is the first time we are having an in-person one. And it's really gratifying. Normally when the program brochure shows the message from a sponsor is coming, I know people drop their heads and think, here we go. <laughs> with glib comments and interspersed with, you know, corporate jargons. None of that from me. <laughs> Our partnership with UPSA on this round table is an alliance um, for me that reflects the bank's overall purpose and commitment to the socioeconomic growth of the country in which we operate. Consistently, we have remained the most profitable and well-capitalized bank in the banking sector and we are not resting on our laurels. And one of the reasons why we are here is also because we want to continue to contribute to the um, discourse, you know, uh, in shaping policy. Anywhere across the world, banking is and remains a precursor to the thriving of economies, promoting big and small businesses, lifting people out of their living standards and elevating countries. And we do the same because um, we're a bank. Over the years, our support as APSA has been the transformation of uh, businesses, governments, economies, and intra-trade across corridors. A bank like ours prides itself in understanding the deeper needs of its customers, clients, and, co and countries, and constantly reinvents to meet them at the point of their need. The recent global pandemic is a testimony to our proactivity in empowering and retooling our people, meaning my colleagues, with the requisite skills to better serve our customers and our clients. We also realigned our operations with cutting edge digital technology and platforms in line with modern workplace transformation agenda brought on by the pandemic. Today, we are a leader in the provision of secured and innovative products for a cross-section of customers, including small businesses, startup, women entrepreneurs. We have also elevated our commitment to youth development with a variety of concepts and initiatives. The after intertrade policy agreement presents a game-changing moment for businesses and countries across the African continent, where most of our clients and customers operate. So our role is to ensure we are leading the way in helping them navigate the changes that will soon confront the terrain due to the trade agreement with comfort and convenience. So the UPSA quarterly banking um, roundtable, now named APSA UPSA quarterly banking roundtable, has become a very convenient platform to discuss emerging issues of benefit to our clients and customers with the relevant expertise and take away key learnings to empower the industry. Additionally, it is also a platform to enable academia and other stakeholders feed into solutions being preferred to overcome some of the intractable challenges facing our sphere of influence. So we have indeed enjoyed our association with the UPSA, and we've done that through Dean Kofi Abochi, Dean of the UPSA Law School, and um, Gertrude, I'm a lecturer and the coordinator for the round table. Um, they approached us first. I do believe there's a committee, but our touch points is through Dean Kofi Abochi. And I look forward to an interesting round table. So in conclusion, I encourage all to take active uh, part in the engagements and contribute where appropriate in order to utilize the learnings and outcome into practicable solutions to bring the possibilities of our stakeholders Alive. Thank you very much.
Yes, let's put our hands together for um, Nana Isofua Tamaklo once again. She's a marketing and corporate relations director of APSA Bank. So one thing I pick away from whatever she said, APSA Bank is a transformational bank. And it's, it's no wonder that we have this partnership because transformational leadership is taking place at the UPSA Law School as well under Dean Abochi. So you are, we are indeed happy to have you as partners. Now, we are going to begin with our discussion. And I think at this point, I have to hand over the microphone to my colleague, Christine, who would take it over. And as and when I'm needed, I will come in. So Christine, it's over to you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Koshiga. Um, once again, a very warm welcome to our esteemed panel members. Um, the UPSA Law School and the university community as a whole is really honored that you could join us to discuss this all important topic. Um, if you're just joining us, we are discussing the critical issue of trade financing under the African continental free trade area and the role that African banks have to play in that regard. And so just before we delve into the discussion, which we are going to do soon, um, just as a bit of a background, um, I'm sure that my panel members would agree with me that um, trade finance is a powerful instrument that if well designed, it would help to foster a successful intra-African trade and regional integration in general, and that our banks need to hold themselves out in readiness for this task. But the reality on the ground really is that um, banking supports for businesses and enterprises um, in Ghana and on their continent is a bit lacking, especially if you're looking at it from a global best experience. And so the challenge really is that it will undermine the prospects that has been presented under the AFCFTA agreement. And so we are just going to be discussing today the banking sector in Ghana and on the continent relative to trade financing. Um, so to my very first question, um, Mr. Sehadzi, what would you say is the state of trade financing on the continent? And um, does the AFCFTA have any role to play in trade financing at all? Uh, good afternoon. Let, let me um, uh, start with an introduction before uh, I go straight to your question. Um, first of all, to thank the organizers. I, I, I will not go through uh, the protocol, but I know uh, the organizers um, had thought that the FCFTA Secretariat is a very key um, uh, partner uh, to the UPSA and also uh, to this event. Um, and the FCFTA, because the question is about trade finance, I just want to uh, set the context that the FCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, is a wide framework. It's a wide framework um, which is addressing mainly um, the challenge that Africa has been facing for a long time, uh, the challenge of limited intra-African trade. And the reason why the intra-African trade has been so low, there are many of them, and one of them has been uh, trade finance, the issue of trade finance, lack of finance, because there will be infrastructure bottlenecks, there will be um, a limited mobility of factors of production, but the finance has been a big challenge. And at the FCFT, because we are a policy organization, uh, we believe that the, challenge, the biggest challenge about trade finance is not about the lack of money. I think it's about how do we integrate our markets, our financial market? How do our banks uh, collaborate? How do our banks trust, uh, tr trust the, their customers? Because um, if you want to make an investment in Ghana and you are coming from Kenya, you would wish to be funded by a bank in Ghana because your project is in Ghana. But the bank in Ghana should have information about the customer who is coming from Kenya. So what the FCFTA agreement does, it provides for a protocol on trade services. 
and that protocol on trade services we address in particular um, the financial services among other sectors and um, through regulations the protocol will make sure that we establish um, sectoral regulations on financial sector and one of those regulations will not only allow the movement of capital, but we also allow the access to capital uh, by the business community. And we think that some of the challenges that affect um, the high level of interest rate in Africa uh, compared to other interest rate in other uh, parts of the world is because of those uh, policy related challenges. There is a risk, of course, associated with uh, the users of the money uh, with the low level of um, uh, uh, paying back the loan, but also the policies have made it complicated to have access to the funding. The other critical issue is the issue of exchange rate. Exchange rate, which also has impact on inflation, uh, is very important to be addressed through the FCFTA market. For so long, Africa has been depending on importation of uh, finished products from outside the continent when we are only selling our raw materials. So this means that we are busy paying our money outside the continent to import goods that are produced there, which has made the cost of accessing money in Africa very high because every cash that we have, we send it outside for importation. So the FCFTA is going to change that trend. We make sure that we consume what we produce on the continent. And then with doing so, we are saving. We are saving the money that used to go out for um, importation. And then at least there will be um, the low cost of accessing loan. The, the banks will also have access to, um, um, to the currency, to the, uh, like today when you look for um, dollars in some of the banks, you find it very complicated and that's why you see the exchange rate is always um, going up on a daily basis. So the FCFTA has put up a number of frameworks that will address those structural uh, challenges that affect the cost of trade finance. Um, thank you for that. Um, you make two important um, comments in relation to um, the role of banks and the need for them to collaborate and um, the need for them to have a relationship with their clients as well. So I come to you, Mr. Solomon, um, in, in response to that, in respect of what the role of banks should be. Um, should banks take an active role that is um, creating the systems and mechanisms um, to facilitate trade or is it more like um, a passive role in terms of sitting back and seeing um, whether business and enterprises come to them? So thank you very much, Christine. Um, good afternoon to the audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the platform. Specific to the role of um, banks in trade financing on the continent, we currently have a situation where there's a funding gap of about $81 billion. That is huge. That's humongous. And to be honest, that requires more than just the commercial banks to help bridge that gap. We require proactive engagement with DFIs to be able to de-risk some of the transactions, to be able to you know, bridge the gap that we have. $81 billion is a lot. Secondly, um, to be able to do that, you actually need strong and systematic banks across the continent. Um, we are at very varying levels of um, market ma maturity across the continent, and there's a need for banks to partner with regulators, etc., to be able to upscale and adopt best practice within the industry, to have that resilience, to be able to and make a dent into that $81 billion gap. Um, before I continue, and just to um, go back a bit around you know, the landscape of um, trade in Africa, um, we currently have a situation where we are still closely aligned to what we had um, in the colonial period. You know, we have a situation where our economies are still built to export our raw materials, just as um, Puden said. 
you know, our participation levels um, on the global trade um, front is actually very low. It's around um, three to five percent. That's very low. And we also do not trade amongst ourselves. If you look at the latest data, intra-Africa trade just accounts for about 13 percent of the trade that the continent does, which means that 87 percent, you know, is trade that is done with the outside, you know, world. And this is very low, significantly low, as compared to what pertains in other markets and other jurisdictions. If you look at Asia, if you look at um, Europe, you look at America, they are in their 30s, 40s, and 60s, um, respectively. So um, the after has actually come at a very opportune time, and we believe it's a game changer towards changing that colonial um, trade mechanism and systems that have been um, put in place and are still prevalent on the continent, as well as to help lift the majority of our people um, from poverty. To go back to um, the role of banks, so the first one is financing, and it's our responsibility, working with regulators, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure that we're able to bridge that gap. Another thing that we need to do um, is to proactively engage fintechs. Um, the level of financial inclusion um, on the continent, um, whilst it's growing, is not at its optimum. And as commercial banks, um, we, will, we are not in a position to cover the entirety of the geography. We have technology that we can leverage on. And it's up to us to engage and partner with these fintechs to deepen financial inclusion across the continent. Additionally, another role that we have is to help with the payment and settlement um, system on the continent. With the various um, currencies that we have on the market, um, with various um, regimes in terms of how it's managed, there are some that are fixed, um, there are floating regimes, there are you know, anything anywhere in between that. You know, payment is a bit fragmented and it's actually easier to um, trade in foreign currency dollars, etc. It's actually easier to settle in those foreign currencies as against um, with some of our local um, African currencies. So there's the need to support the effort that um, after the Secretariat in partnership with AfriExam you know, is, is undertaking in terms of harmonizing and creating one Pan-African payment and settlement system. It will go a long way to help us to lower the cost of the transaction and to offer um, funding to more people. Um, the last um, bit of uh, responsibility that we have as a bank in, in this um, after is around ensuring that um, compliance, fraud, risk, etc., is minimized. Um, it's up to us to be able to know our clients, to conduct the due diligence required on our clients, to minimize um, the opportunity for um, clients and other um, um, businesses who are not so, um, who are not so um, in terms of uh, their uh, uh, integrity, etc., who are not there, I, I don't use the exact term, to, to, to be able to keep them out of the system and to make sure that we are actually supporting those that really need a finance. So our role um, broadly can be categorized in, in these three areas. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to something that you said. Um, you talked about various currencies floating on the market. And there's been a call for a common African regional currency, um, like the euro. And I, any of you can respond to this. Would you say that is the way to go? And how is that going to help trade financing across the continent? So I believe um, that the enormous benefits to having um, a common currency um, it helps lower the cost of um, the transaction um, by minimizing exchange losses. Um, it helps to um, make trade transactions you know, um, happen um, in a faster and more convenient way. It allows for investment um, and it allows for um, companies to be able to um, carry out projections in the medium to long term. So the benefits of having a common currency are, are numerous. Um, the challenge, however, and, and so for me, I believe that it's, it's time uh, we brought the discussion around um, having a common currency 
to the forefront. Um, it's been a bit in the background. We need to bring it to the forefront. So definitely the time is ripe for us to be having the conversation now. Um, to have currency union, um, you need um, a number of things to happen. So you need political stability, you need economic um, stability as well. Um, our unfortunate reality is that on the continent, in the last six months, I, I believe we've had about two coup d'etats. You know? So that doesn't really help from a political stability angle. To be able to also have um, a common um, currency, you require um, the creation of a continent-wide central bank, which would mean that banks and, um, sorry, um, governments and local central banks will have to relinquish part of their power into this um, uh, regional central bank. You know, and that takes a lot of political will you know, to happen. On the economic front, um, there are a number of indices and uh, criteria that uh, local markets will need to meet to be able to join a currency union. So um, there are criteria that are set around macroeconomic indices such as inflation, um, uh, debt to GDP, uh, fiscal deficits, et cetera. And given that um, across the continent, we are at various levels of um, economic development, bringing all of that together, uh, I believe, will be a very daunting task. Nonetheless, um, I believe there's a way we could um, go around some of these um, tenuous issues, and that is by using technology. We've seen that the central bank, for example, is piloting um, e-currency. For me, I believe it's the way to go. Um, we can leverage on blockchain technology, we can leverage on um, e-money, etc., to get to the same solution that perhaps um, paper and coin currencies can give us without spending as much and without taking so much time to get to that um, uh, conclusion. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will, I'll come back to Mr. Sehabazi. Um, in terms of um, currency, still talking about currency, and we know that the Naira and the Ghana City are quite volatile. Um, what would you say um, are the challenges to the prospects that are presented under the AFCFTA? Um, let, let me, let, let me um, confirm uh, some of the benefits that the, the currency itself uh, provides to trade facilitation, because this is very important um, to understand. Um, the smaller the economy is, uh, the more difficult it becomes uh, for their currency to be internationally trusted because uh, the whole value of the currency is based on the trust. And um, um, if you look at the statistics today, um, the, 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 the United States dollar um, accounts for close to 60% of all global trade transactions are, are done in US dollar, 60% of them. And uh, the European Union, which is using now Euro, uh, they have about 20% of transactions. So the rest of other currencies is only 30%. So now you can imagine uh, the weight that a strong currency is having in uh, international transactions. This means that when you are using a small country currency, you are facing a number of challenges. You will not control inflation. You will not control, you will not attract uh, transactions, but there is also a very serious cost associated to uh, transacting with uh, different currencies. Like currently, we have uh, 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 more than 42 currencies on the continent uh, among 55 countries, and the cost of transaction has been estimated to about $5 billion annually. Just the cost of transaction converting from currency to currency to do trade in the continent. So the benefits of having a single currency cannot be overemphasized. Then the other point which uh, he mentioned I want to assure you is the issue of the central bank. There have been a number of initiatives across the continent. Uh, we have in West Africa, uh, in East Africa, uh, they are putting in place a monetary union but at African level, um, there is already an institution called the African Central Bank, uh, which is yet to be operationalized, but which is established by the, uh, the AU Constitutive Act since 2000. So it means 
the institution is there, but it is not working yet. So we have to give life um, to that institution. So I think those are some of the key elements that we have to emphasize. Now let's come uh, back to the volatility of, um, uh, of our currencies. That's one of the risks, of course, uh, the volatility, because you don't control the inflation rate. Um, if I recall well, um, when I was here in 2015, in Ghana, I think the exchange rate of CD was around three point something, three point five dollar. I mean, one dollar was three point five CD. Today is above six, so it's now it has more than doubled. Do you know the implications of that? The value of dollar has not changed. It has actually appreciated. In economics, there's what, there's what they call um, original sin. Uh, I think that one can also be found in, in the Bible. The original sin, it means if Ghana, for example, contracted a loan in the year 2015, they did not contract that loan in Ghana cities. They contracted that loan in foreign currency, let's say in United States dollar. So at the time, the money that you have taken has now been doubled. Apart from interest rate that you have to pay, you will still have to pay double of what you have borrowed. So now you are losing doubly. You are losing in what you are paying back and you are also paying interest rate constantly. So the issue of volatility, I think, can only be addressed by two things. One, what is the level of production? What do we produce on the continent? vis-a-vis -vis what we consume. What is the structure of our economies? Um, we have said that Africa is relying on importation. And when you look at even the structure of what we import compared to what we are exporting, we are only exporting raw materials and processed products. And we are depending on the prices that are fixed by international market. We do not determine the prices of gold, even if gold can be extracted here. We do not determine the price of gold. We depend on prices that have been set somewhere else. We do not determine the price of coffee, of tea, everything that we're exporting. The price is just a given. So that one will also affect our exchange rate. So we don't produce enough, but we do not determine the price of what we produce. And our currencies are not strong enough to influence the international financial market. And those two challenges can only be addressed by the FCFTA, by integrating our market. Um, I think it's quite revealing the, the challenge that this currency volatility presents for us. But I would like you also to comment on the systemic and structural bottlenecks. Um, that affect trade financing in Africa and under the AFCFTA, um, how can this be avoided? Um, the, the, w one thing that um, we have seen, uh, apart from, of course, that fragmentation of currencies, um, I think the cost of transaction itself has affected a lot the cost of money. I know, I know um, I'm not a banker, but I know many business people don't want to contract a loan because the cost of getting money from a bank is much higher than what you expect as a return on your investment. That's a big challenge. And we are not blaming the banks because even the banks are, getting, are using money that doesn't belong to them. The banks are also using money that belongs to uh, international banks. So I think um, it's, it's, it's very complicated. The only way to address this challenge is to bring down the cost of money. That's the only way we can do it. We, we, yes, we still need money, but how can we bring down the cost of that money? And the cost of money, you see it um, in the inflation rate, you see it in the, in the risk that you run to get repaid, you see it in the structure of the economy, when we are not producing enough to give more value to our local currency, 
and all those issues have to be addressed by different actors. Um, he earlier on mentioned the Pan-African payment system is one of the initiatives that FCFTA um, is bringing up together with Afrexim Bank, Africa Import and Export Bank. And we believe um, that once the uh, Pan-African payment and settlement system is operationalized, now it is being tested in a few countries of uh, West African monetary zone, once it is operationalized across the continent, it means that small traders, you will have to, if you export your products to Kenya and you get paid in a Kenyan shilling, then it will be much easier for you to convert the Kenyan shilling into Ghana cities without a loss of transaction. Because when you do so today, you get Kenyan shilling, you have to convert it in US dollars, and when you come back here, again you convert US dollars into uh, Ghana cities, then you will uh, you will lose twice. You will lose twice because when you go to the Forex Bureau, there is always a difference between uh, the selling and the buying uh, price. So that's one of the things that we are going to address through uh, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System. I'll, I'll give Mr. Solomon a chance to respond to that. Um, but before you do so, um, he mentioned something with respect to the challenge of banks with businesses. So I, I wonder if you can comment on small and medium scale enterprises. What them, one of the challenges has been this lack of access to trade finance. So if you could comment on what they can do to take advantage um, in respect to the banks. Right. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to um, your last question around SMEs, um, let me just say a few things um, about his submission. Um, so um, I agree and align with um, you know, what he said. Um, the question for us then is, does it mean nothing can be done? And I don't believe that's the case. Um, if you take a look at the high interest rate regime that we have in a number of markets um, that we have, there's a way clients can actually reduce the cost of the loans that they, they borrow. So um, I'll give two ways. So the first one is um, clients that actually go into production and take advantage of this um, bigger market. They export, currently they would be earning dollars. There is uh, a chance for banks to actually lend in dollars and the cost of dollar is actually cheaper than the cost of a lot of the local currencies that we have. So those that are into production, um, it's not time to despair. Please produce and the dollars. And once there is that right way risk where you earn dollars, we are more than happy to provide you funding in dollars. And it also goes to the partnerships that we have with um, DFIs, et cetera, who come into the risk and who come into actually also lower the cost of the funding, but it's mainly around the, the foreign currencies. So please take advantage of um, the bigger market. Please produce, receive dollars. We will lend to you in dollars, and you know, that will bring the, the cost down. The second um, way, you know, the cost you pay on a loan is a function of three things. It's a function of the interest rate. It's a function of the amount that you draw or you borrow. And it's a function of the tenor of the, of the transaction. Oftentimes, uh, we see that based on the model of clients, you know, which uh, we consider to be quite inefficient, they actually borrow money now, use that money to pay in advance you know, for products outside of, uh, of the continent or outside of the country, wait for you know, that input to come, use it as part of their manufacturing process um, before converting it into, into cash. That, that is inefficient. They are trade solutions that are available um, through the use of contingent liabilities, for example, um, letters of credit, guarantees, etc. That will still give um, the comfort to your suppliers to still give you the goods without actually having to borrow in advance and uh, to borrow now, pay in advance. That, that's double cost. And that leads significantly to the cost um, of, of loans that um, businesses do in care. So these are but two um, imperatives. And it's very important that as you go about um, your 
commercial activity, commercial negotiation and bargaining, please do involve us banks early enough in the process to be able to help guide and advise you as to how you can um, maximize you know, um, your commerce efficiency, which would then in turn reduce um, the cost um, that you, you incur on, on borrowing. With regards to um, SMEs and um, what we would want to see um, uh, to give us additional comfort um, to fund, uh, we, we realize that lots of SMEs are actually thriving. You know. Well, so we are live here at the um, you know, University of Professional Studies here at the West Wing Auditorium, and this is the set edition of the um, UPSA, the APSA UPS Law School quarterly banking roundtable discussion. So the speakers or reps from APSA Bank as well as the AFC, FTA have been touching on quite a number of issues here at the University of Professional Studies that is here in Accra. So they, they had to touch on issues con con confronting the stabilization of the city also whether that this is the right time for the continent to have a common currency. Let me speak to the coordinator of the program here the roundtable discussion would also tell me, um, take me through what they, they seem to achieve in, the, in all this. Right. Good afternoon and thank you very much for having me. So the APSA UPSA Law School Quarterly Banking Roundtable has been in existence for a little over a year. And the purpose of the roundtable has been to provide a platform for the sustained discussion of core issues affecting the banking sector in Ghana. We are of the view that trade financing is very key to a successful implementation of the AFCFTA. As a result, we have brought together these experts to delve into matters that would bring out or that would determine the readiness of our banking sector for trade financing uh, under the AFCFTA. We believe that if Ghanaians, if Ghanaian traders are going to benefit from the AFCFTA, then trade financing ought to be taken seriously and that is the main reason why we have brought together these experts for this discussion. At the end of the day we are hoping for two main things. Um, first of all, we are hoping that our banks would be able to take away certain key strategies which would help them to prepare themselves uh, in terms of financing trade under the AFCFTA. And for the ordinary Ghanaian who is actually our main um, target, you'd be able to know some of the issues that you ought to know concerning trade financing and how to better position yourself uh, using trade financing for a successful um, implementation of the AFCFTA. All right, so she is the coordinator for the program. Yeah, she's in the person of Gertrude Amma. So basically what they're trying to let us understand is we're taking trade financing very serious as a continent and also try as much as possible to achieve the AFCFTA goals um, in the country. They are targeting 1.3 billion people in the continent. That, is, that has to do with respect to the continental wide free trade and also with an economic block of $3.4 trillion. So over to you, Aisha, in the studio. That's James Ishen. And that was James Ishen uh, for us at the UPSA APSA quarterly banking roundtable and speaking on bank straight financing and the AFC FTA. Now, this afternoon, there's more bloodshed in the Ashanti region as another accident claims the lives of two people, bringing the death toll through road crashes in the last three days to 25. Earlier today, a tipper truck crashed into a stationary commercial vehicle, killing two people on the spot. Lines uh, incensed by the incident, angry residents of Pankorno in Kumasi smashed the windscreen of the truck. According to eyewitnesses, the truck, which was fully loaded with sand, developed a fault and was abandoned by the busy uh, Tafo Pankorno road. And none of my two o'clock. The doors and it is a bit power. The money is sorry, you know. You're sorry, you know. Any poor car, you do not car, I be rise here. You can't be rise here, not over any day. One crowd will not in some of our crowd that's it. And my man, so on it, some of the crowd need to mean you, my man, yet shank a crap. And send it to me, you may, you, my man, so I'm not sorry. On two, the car is in yard one corner, no good to me, and that's the front door. You see, I'm not one. Can't see what you can't. Can't see what you can see. If you see what you can see, you can see what you can see. 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 You can
my colleague Erasta Sasari Donko joins us live with more. Erasta, who are these two who died in this latest accident? So um, they have been identified as um, Mami Kunedu, uh, 50, a trader who trades in garden eggs and vegetables, and the driver of the vehicle, uh, Bashiru uh, Yusuf, 34, who is the driver of the vehicle. They both died um, instantly uh, during the crash. Now, Erasmus, we understand that residents are blaming uh, uh, local assembly for failing to tow the stationary vehicle. I mean, why are they doing that? Well, because they say that this truck uh, belongs to Kofi Job Construction, uh, one of the main contractors of roads in the Ashanti region. And this truck uh, um, has been stationary on the road, obstructing traffic uh, on Tuesday for hours. And they say that the assembly has a policy that whoever parks on uh, unauthorized sections of the road I guess his, his or her vehicle towed. And so they, as drivers, uh, commercial vehicle drivers, have had their vehicles towed uh, on many occasions. And so they don't understand why uh, this particular vehicle will be left sitting uh, on the side of the road uh, for as long as it will take for another vehicle to crash into it. And that's why many of them got angry and vented their spleen on the uh, tipper truck smashing his windscreen uh, in the process. But if you look at the um, Sanyon vehicle, it's a minibus uh, that I was traveling from Atebubu uh, towards Kumase around 2 a.m. That particular stretch of road is a very busy traffic prone area, I have this impact, which has uh, killed the two of them. And in fact, at dawn, uh, police say that drivers speed on that road. They even ignore signals to stop by the police. And so that is what is causing uh, many of the knockdowns and accidents on that particular stretch at Tafu Pankron. Erasmus, any updates on the previous accidents? I mean, the Monday accident that took the lives of 17 people and that of Tuesday that took the lives of six people. So we have some updates on the uh, Abafour accident, the offensive Abafour accident, which claimed 17 lives on the spot. We do understand that three more children have died um, at the hospital, bringing the death toll to uh, 20 as we speak. And so that's the update on the offensive Abafour accident. And then when you go to the Akumadan accident, uh, which claimed six lives, um, police say they have arrested the driver of the bus who fled the accident scene when it occurred. And so currently he is in their custody assisting in investigations. Rasta Sasari Donko is a man in the Ashanti region and he's been giving us updates on accidents that has been happening on our roads from Monday. There was one on Monday, one on Tuesday, and today another that has killed um, two people. Now, before we go, there's a reaction coming from the camp of the Medina MP Francis Susu uh, regarding the uh, charges that were pressed on him this afternoon by the police. Just so you may know that he's been charged with unlawful blockade of road and unlawful destruction of property. And there's also been reaction from parliament. Let's speak with spokesperson of the Medina MP uh, who joins us uh, this afternoon. I'm grateful for your time, Mr. Bansi. Um, how are you taking the news of police charging uh, Mr. Francis Soso with those two charges? Kindly unmute for me. Oh, wait, sorry. Yeah, I am. Um, my microphone is live. Can you hear me, please? Loud and clear. 
Right, thank you so much and good evening to you and your listeners. Actually, we are taken aback because um, with the police service, that seems to have repositioned itself to the admiration of many Ghanaians. It is very disturbing and baffling that they will engage in the peddling of falsehood and, and and as we speak now, the member of parliament for the Madina constituency has not been served with any court summons. And I am particularly surprised that a senior police officer in the person of ACP, Kusifuri, will decide to disrespect parliament and the speaker of parliament and then disrespect the people of Ghana by deceiving them that he have served a member of parliament for Madina constituency lawyer. Hello, Mr. Bansi. All right, so here's the spokesperson for uh, the Medina MP, Francis Soso, and he's been reacting to those two charges that have been pressed on the Medina MP. Uh, we'll try and get him back on this one. Mr. Bansi, are you back? Hello, Mr. Bansi. All right, so um, uh, those are the reactions coming from the camp of uh, Francis Susu, and he says that, uh, all right, so Mr. Bansi is back on. Uh, so make your point uh, you were making earlier. All right, so we're having a bit of connection challenges with Mr. Bansi. If we try, if we get him back, we'll bring him back on the pulse. But if not, we'll still raise him in our subsequent bulletins to get those reactions from Mr. Sisu's camp. We'll take a break on the pulse and we'll bring you more in sports shortly. <laughs> 